the K-Pro4 Plus 88, a Zilog Z80 and an Intel 8088, CPM and MS-DOS. Let's put this unusual machine through its paces right now in episode 62 of Retro Bits. In the last episode, we took a first look at the K-Pro4 Plus 88 and diagnosed a problem that turned out to be the floppy disk controller. With the machine now fully operational, let's take a look at both CPM and MS-DOS so we can try and determine what this thing is actually capable of. Released in 1974, Control Program Slash Monitor was created by Gary Kildall, the founder of Digital Research Incorporated. One of the very first general purpose operating systems, CPM was later renamed to Control Program for Microcomputers and became the de facto standard of the day, especially within the business market. CPM abstracted away the hardware, allowing software to be portable across many different system configurations in a standardized manner. Up till this point, such portability had not existed in the computer industry. This contributed to a substantial software market and install base for the OS, with over 200 different models of computers being supported. That includes some familiar names like Altair, Imsi, and Osborne, along with many home computer systems from the likes of Apple, Atari, and Commodore, as well as the BBC Micro, Coleco Atom, MSX, Amstrad CPC, TRS-80, and many more. If you're familiar with later DOS systems, the CPM command structure will immediately look familiar. This is no coincidence, as many aspects of the operating system were copied by Microsoft. In turn, CPM borrowed concepts from Unix and Digital Equipment Corporation's earlier operating systems. CPM's console command processor implements built-in functions like dir, type, erase, and rename. If the user enters a command that is not built in, the current disk will then be searched for an executable, similar to how both Unix and DOS work even to this day. CPM does not support subdirectories, but rather has the concept of separate user areas, up to 16 per disk. These allow for rudimentary file management, but aren't as flexible as nested directories. Instead of copy, CPM implements a peripheral interchange program, or PIP. The target doesn't have to be a file or disk, it could be the console, a printer, punch card, or other attached device. The syntax is in the format of target, the equal sign, and the source. Look familiar? This is the same exact syntax used by Jiffy DOS for file operations on the Commodore 64. I wonder if Mark Fellows was a CPM user. One thing I found particularly interesting were the line editing and output controls. Take a look. How many of these are still in use by modern operating systems today? I'd hazard that it's almost all of them in one form or another. Heck, I still use commands like Control u and Control r daily when working on the Linux command line. While the OS may have abstracted away the hardware to a large degree, one major issue with CPM was that there were many different incompatible disk formats between manufacturers. This was even a problem amongst the different models of Kpro machine. Because of this, publishers needed to sell their software in upwards of two dozen different disk formats in order to cover the popular systems on the market. This will come back to haunt me later when I try to use a Kpro 4 plus 88 disk image from the internet on my Kpro 4 plus 88. Apparently, even within the same model, there were format differences and incompatibilities. About that. From what I've been able to ascertain, my K-Pro 4 Plus 88 is based on the hardware revision from 1983. What's on the screen is also a 4 Plus 88, but this time a 1984 model. A dead giveaway is the switch from the full height tandem drives on my model to the half height units shown here. Around the back is even more telling. 
There's a second serial port that's absent on my model, as well as a built-in modem. In fact, the 1984 model has an entirely different system board. Known as the Universal Board, the 84 was based on a shared platform also used in the K-Pro 10 and other models. Keep this nugget in the back of your head as we press on with the software testing. The first application we'll look at is WordStar by MicroPro International. This word processing application ruled the roost in the 1980s. Originally released in 1978 for CPM, it was later made available for DOS, Windows, and other operating systems. The software supports many of the features we take for granted in modern word processors, including text styles, formatting and pagination, mail merge, spell check, copy paste, and much more. While not true what you see is what you get, WordStar was the first to implement a textual indicator of what styles were applied to the on-screen text. I remember a similar interface in AppleWorks on my family's 2C back in the day, but WordStar was doing it six years earlier. The application's performance is snappy, with only short pauses for disk access from time to time when performing various commands. The K-Pro's 9-inch display is crisp and easily readable, unlike some of the other portables of the day. You would absolutely have been able to do real work on the system for hours at a time. Next up, we have Perfect Calc, one of the bundled productivity titles from Perfect Software. These included programs gave K-Pro a competitive advantage that helped them become the leader in the portable market. It was said that buying the software separately would have more than doubled the cost of the system, and only KPro was offering such bundles at the time. It's neat to revisit these old productivity titles to see just where we started and how far things have come. This spreadsheet works just like you'd expect, and I didn't even have to find a manual to figure out how to input a simple formula. Next up is Borland Turbo Pascal. I did have to find a manual for this one, as I've never programmed in the language before. Also, like the other titles we've looked at, it's only marginally menu-driven, and you really need to know what the hotkeys are to accomplish anything. Something's wrong with the software's terminal definition for this particular K-Pro. I selected the correct option in the configuration, but there are clearly differences between models, and I can't see what I'm typing with these settings. Heh, <laughs> my first Pascal program, compiled and fully operational. Are you not impressed? Last, we have BCN, Business Telecommunication Software, for use with Hayes Smart Modem. Welcome to the exciting world of networking. I was hoping I could use this included disk to get online, connect to a BBS, and download some software. Unfortunately, it looks to me like this was some kind of commercial service offering. I've never heard of this one. Did any of you use BCN back in the day? Every option I tried from the menu seemed to require a profile to use. I wonder if BCN was somehow associated with CompuServe. Oh well, it's time to move on and try something else instead.
We've got a DB25 serial port on the back, so all that's needed to get online is my trusty Y modem 232. I reviewed this device ages ago, but the TLDR is, if you have old computers, you should get one. What's super cool is that CPM includes a terminal emulator program on the main OS disk. I wish all operating systems did that. It's bare bones, there's no file transfer capability or flow control that I could figure out, so 2400 baud is pushing it. Still, it's a welcome inclusion and getting online with the system is a snap. Since I can't download any software with this program, its usefulness is limited. Let's try something a bit more powerful. In the last episode, I was able to use software called Convert on my Tandy 1000 to move a single file over to a KPro formatted floppy. That file was Kermit.com, a popular file transfer tool that's still supported to this day. With a single apt-get command, I was able to install the latest version of Kermit on my home Linux server. With the software running on both ends, transferring files using plain ASCII between any type of disparate system is a snap. You can imagine how useful this would have been back in the day when all the CPM systems had incompatible disk formats. I tested this configuration up to 9600 baud with flow control enabled and the transfer was rock solid. At that rate, it keeps the disk busy pretty much constantly. Alright, so here's the CPM version of Pac-Man that I just downloaded from the internet and transferred to the K-Pro with Kermit. Well, okay, it's recognizable as Pac-Man, I guess. The controls aren't great though. If you don't time your direction changes perfectly, you'll end up at a dead stop staring at the wall. Also, the AI isn't very aggressive, at least on the first level. The K-Pro has no graphics capability and no sound, apart from a beeper speaker. It's honestly pretty limited for something that was sold in 1984. The system also comes bundled with Microsoft Basic 80 plus selected games. Let's have a look. This one is called Ladder. If you use your imagination, you can see the resemblance to Donkey Kong. I think this is probably the best of the games I tried on the system. The controls are actually pretty tight, and I like how you can pick up the ladder mid-jump, something that many later games with graphics couldn't even get right. You've got to pay attention to when the barrels despawn, because new ones will appear to replace them immediately after, just like that. Level 2 is where the game really comes into its own. You have to time your jumps perfectly to clear the barriers or you'll plummet all the way back to the ground level. On the whole, this one is pretty good for an ASCII text game. Short though, there are only two stages and then it repeats at a harder difficulty.
And last up, we have this Space Invaders clone called Alien. Okay, so yeah, this is a business-oriented machine and video games aren't its strong suit. I'm sure it was fine for a small diversion now and then when the boss wasn't looking though. The system can only redraw the screen so quickly, so the speed is going to be limited by the specs of the hardware. As in the original arcade game, the pace does pick up slightly at the end simply because there are fewer aliens to render. Last time, I said we'd take a closer look at the keyboard, so here it is. The unit itself is quite the chonker, but it would have to be in order to support the entire 26 pounds of the portable-ish K-Pro. As a result of the large sheet metal housing required for this feat, it does sound a bit hollow when typing. The keyboard itself was manufactured by the MaxiSwitch company. The ergonomics are good, and the layout is surprisingly modern, with control, caps lock, shift, tab return, and backspace positioned more or less where you'd expect them to be. Key travel is fairly long, and it feels good to type on. The keys do feel like they're binding up against each other a little bit. That may be a maintenance issue, or just the way it was designed. Commodores? What? Well, I thought it would be fun to compare the K-Pro to the SX-64, which came to market around the same time as the 4 Plus 88, and up till now has been my measuring stick for a luggable machine. I still contend that the SX is large and heavy, but as you can see the K-Pro dwarfs it at almost double the height. Surprisingly, the larger machine weighs only 3 pounds more, but it's mostly empty inside. True to its purpose as a business machine, the 9-inch monochrome screen is much easier to read than the Commodore's 5-inch color display, and could easily be used for work or at home for hours on end. The Commodore has way better games and a more pleasing aesthetic, although that, of course, is a personal opinion. Another thing I wanted to try was interoperability with the Commodore 128, which was designed to run CPM. Let's test with the K-Pro's bundled version of WordStar. Look at the bottom of the screen. The 128 recognized the disc as a K-Pro 4 format. The Commodore version of CPM is able to understand nine different popular formats from systems such as K-Pro, Osborne, Epson, and IBM. And look at that, it just works! That's the famous CPM portability I was talking about. One thing to note is that the Commodore is much slower than the K-Pro. Disk access is reasonable, but screen updates with the 80-column VDC chip are notoriously slow. In the last episode, I attempted to create disks for the K-Pro using my Tandy 1000 and a variety of DOS-based imaging programs. I was able to copy single files to existing floppies, but I had no luck writing entire disk images due to incompatibilities with the Tandy's drive controller. Well, I'm back for another round of disk imaging, and this time I brought reinforcements. This beast of a 486 was loaned to me by Simon Verischachner. To it, I've connected my Tandy's double density drive. 
High density drives like the one in this 486 spin at a higher RPM, making them difficult to use when imaging disks for older systems like the K-Pro. It did take a while to get everything set up correctly, as it was necessary to configure the system's BIOS options, the drive jumpers, and the orientation of the ribbon cable. We actually tried using four different drives in total before arriving at a configuration that worked using the Tandy 1000 unit. In the end, I was able to create new CPM and DOS disks for the K-Pro using the same image disk software as before, this time without any controller related errors. Thanks to Simon for the loan of his machine and helping me fiddle around with the stuff for hours. Right, so here's the MS-DOS 2.11 boot disk for the K-Pro 4 Plus 88 that I just created. Hmm, that's not good. The banner comes up, but the system just freezes and won't boot to a prompt. To remove variables, I tried writing the image a dozen more times with different software settings, floppy drives, brands of media, and imaging programs, but was never able to get it to boot further than this. But this is interesting. If I boot from a known good disk, I can read the floppy I just made on the PC. I think the creation process is alright, just that the image I got from the internet isn't compatible with my version of the 4 Plus 88. So I copied the necessary files to my good boot disk, but look at this, it can't find the 8088. I'm pretty sure this confirms that the image I got isn't suitable for my 1983 system. It must be for the 1984 version with the universal board. Unfortunately, it's the only image I could find on the internet, so it looks like I'm stuck with the older MS-DOS 1.25 disk that came with the machine. While MS-DOS 2.11 didn't work, there is another program on the disk I want to try, the RAM disk software. It allows CPM to utilize the 8088's 256K of memory as a high-speed drive. Unfortunately, when I ran the software, it just locked up and didn't do anything. I was able to locate a copy of the SWP CoPower manual for a Zorba CPM machine and in it, I found the valid address ranges the adapter board can be configured to, so I tried them all. The first 14 I tried resulted in the same lockup, but on the 15th attempt... Success! From what I've read, the CoPower hardware address is programmed into the PAL chip on the adapter board at the factory, and is then coded into the software that originally shipped with the machine. Since this MS-DOS image is for a different system, my guess is the default address is different from my board. That's probably also why the DOS connector didn't work. Right, let's benchmark this thing. Here's WordStar loading from floppy once again. Okay, now I'll reboot and copy WordStar and my saved document into the RAM disk. The time to beat is 19 seconds. Yeah, okay, that's pretty darn zippy, and most of the time was spent drawing the screen, not accessing the disk. I can see how this would be a really useful feature if you were working on multiple documents all day, every day. If you were going to do this every day, you'd want some sort of automation around the process, and the manual is helpful here as well. Using a submit file, the CPM equivalent to a DOS batch file or a Unix shell script, you can automatically populate the RAM disk, load WordStar, and copy your document files back to permanent storage when you exit the program. Neat! By this point, I'd spent untold hours tearing apart and reassembling four different systems, moving drives around, creating and testing dozens of floppies, and swapping disks hundreds of times. 
I finally tired of this unreliable process and decided to try using a GoTech drive running the flash floppy firmware. Using a PC floppy cable, the edge connector goes to the existing drive B and the pin header end after the twist is connected to the GoTech. To make it show up as drive A, I needed to set the drive select 1 jumper instead of 0, which is then flipped by the cable. This GoTech drive was donated to the channel by Kevin Gonzalez, so thanks Kevin for this very useful piece of kit. Nice! It worked on the very first try. How awesome is that? Before we go any further, these original K-Pro discs don't seem to exist anywhere on the internet that I could find, so I'm going to create images to preserve and archive them. Someone else out there may have a 1983 model of K-Pro 4 Plus 88 and need these someday. That done, I needed to convert the image disk format into something that'll work with the Flash Floppy firmware. For this, I use the HXC Floppy Emulator software. The converted files get loaded on the USB stick and that's it. No other configuration is necessary, as the K-Pro uses the standard ShoeGuard interface, which is the default mode of operation for the GoTech. Let's try that MS-DOS 2.11 image again, this time with the GoTech instead of a physical floppy. And we get the exact same error as before. This gives me even more confidence that my disk creation process was, in fact, good, and that it's the image itself that just doesn't work on my hardware. Since the DOS 2.11 disk still doesn't work, let's try version 1.25 that came with the machine. It should be hard-coded to work with my CoPower adapter, unlike the copy I got from the internet. While the RAM disk software was configurable, there doesn't seem to be any such option to set the address used by the DOS connector short of decompiling the binary. Sweet, it works! Well, now's the moment you've all been waiting for, and I've saved the best for last. Or have I? First, we'll need some software. When creating disks for DOS 1.x on a newer system, it's necessary to use the slash 8 option to specify 8 sectors per track. Now, I'll copy over a variety of text-only applications and games, starting with the useful Check It diagnostic tool. And the verdict is... Nothing. The machine locked up. Okay, how about Norton Commander? Denied. How about VisiCalc? Another crash. Here's the thing. The CoPower 88 isn't IBM PC compatible. It's only DOS compatible. Anything that tries to access the PC's hardware simply won't work. There's no ISA, no MDA, CGA, or Hercules graphics, no 8250 UART, no PC speaker, no PC architecture of any kind, just as key text. The manual even goes so far as to say you need to find software that is non-hardware dependent or perhaps just write your own program. Gee, what fun. Not exactly selling the product, guys. Word Perfect Light? Nope. Amaze? Crash. Beast? Same. Castle Adventure? Called on account of rain. Thank goodness for the GoTech drive, though. After every crash, it requires three disk changes to test out another program. I must have swapped real disks several hundred times before moving to this method. How about Galaxy? Ooh, this is new. Pacquiao? I see a trend. Planetfall? Ejected back to DOS. Look, DOS 1.25 is so old, many of these programs may just not work under the best of conditions. That's why I wanted to get 2.11 working. Another issue is lack of available memory. Either way, I wasn't able to get a single text-based DOS program to work on the K-Pro. So those were my real-world findings with MS-DOS 1.25 on the K-Pro 4 Plus 88. 
Let's see how my experience compares to that of Computer and Electronics Magazine from March of 1984. The KPRO 4 Plus 88, although an IBM PC compatible machine, is limited in many ways. Much of the software written for the IBM PC cannot run on this machine. They go on to say that there are difficulties with the hardware. Memory size is limited to 256K and there are no expansion slots. The finer things of computing such as graphics and color won't be available on the 4 Plus 88. Of course, marketers are going to market, and the genius of the CoPower 88 doesn't stop. You see, CoPower 88 is more than a coprocessor, much more. By the time the KPRO 4 Plus 88 came to market, it was already part of a dying breed. Years earlier, Gary Kildall had famously passed up a contract to supply the operating system for the upcoming IBM PC, and it went to Bill Gates and Microsoft instead. This all but sealed CPM and digital research's fate. DOS PCs and compatibles had already begun their rise to dominance, and as we've now seen, the inclusion of an SWP CoPower 88 didn't do anything to narrow the growing divide. So, final thoughts? Well, the machine is a fascinating piece of history, but that doesn't mean that it was good. The idea of CPM and DOS on the same hardware may have had merit, but the execution was flawed. Regardless, I enjoyed learning all about this K-Pro and I hope you did as well. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time on RetroBits.